Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I see that we've got many, many attendees joining from various parts of the world signing on. We will just give a minute or two to allow um, Zoom just to catch up. Um, but welcome to everyone. We are so thrilled that you are joining us this evening. We are so excited to be sharing some insight into southern Peru with you today. Um, we've got a lot to cover. Um, I know Rob is particularly excited to share his home turf with you. So um, we are well, we will be kicking off in just a few minutes time. We'll just give a minute or two just to allow a few of the uh, stragglers to sign on. Just as we kick off, please remember while the webinar is taking place, there's a question and answer section at the base of your screen. Please feel free to post any and all questions that you have in that question and answer box. I will be available answering questions as we go. Um, and any questions that I'm not personally able to answer, Rob will answer in a live question and answer section at the very end of the webinar. Just to introduce myself, my name is Daniel Danquert. I am the tailor-made tours manager at Rock Jumper Birding Tours. Um, I've been with Rock Jumper for about seven years now. Um, this Dream Destination series started during the COVID-19 months um, as a means with which to share our collective passion as a way of keeping our guides occupied and a way of staying relevant uh, through a period of absolutely no travel. Um, all of the recordings from our previous webinars can be found on the Rock Jumper YouTube page. And going forward, we have many, many more exciting destinations that we'll be covering in the coming months, starting up with Northwestern Argentina on the 27th of March, so in a month's time. Um, the webinars are typically held on the last Wednesday of every month. So um, if you'd like to sign on for those, uh, you can diarize that. We have webinars planned for at least the next five or six months and hopefully more going on uh, forward. All of these are destinations that we haven't covered previously. As a reminder, and just for those who have signed on in the last few minutes, um, please remember to post your question and, uh, questions and answers in the Q&A box below. If you um, land up signing on a bit late or if you missed the first few minutes of this, um, the recording for this webinar will be made available within the next two or three days. It will be posted to Rock Jumper's YouTube page, um, and you can find uh, all of the other recordings for all of our webinars there. So to introduce our speaker tonight, joining us this evening is our expert tour leader, Dr. Rob Williams. Rob hails from the UK, but has had an interest uh, in birds and mammals since he was a child. Uh, generally, he's fascinated in all aspects of the natural world, um, and he studied zoology and went on to obtain a PhD in conservation ecology, so really an expert in his field, working on the long-eared owl population dynamics in Europe. Since 1997, he has worked for several conservation organizations, including the RSPB, BirdLife International, the Wild, Wildlife Conservation Society, and the Frankfurt Zoological Society. He has additionally written four books on birds and birdings, as well as many different scientific articles. He's currently involved in research projects that aim to protect the Andean condor, the white-winged guan, the Andean bear, maned wolf, and giant otter. He is also the scientific director of the award-winning Chapari Reserve, the first community-owned private conservation and air in, in private conservation area in Peru. Rob, we're very fortunate to have someone of your caliber as part of our team. Uh, as I mentioned, Peru really is Rob's home turf, so we're really, really lucky to have you sharing some insight into uh, your home country. Rob has lived in Peru for several years of his life, um, so. On that note, I'm going to hand over to you. I'm really excited to see what you have to say um, and take it away. Thank you very much, Dan. It's a great pleasure to be here with you all this evening. Good evening to everyone or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world or even perhaps good morning. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to take you through a little bit of a journey around southern Peru today. Um, Southern Peru is a, an amazing area. Here it is located on the western side of South America. 
in the in the Andes mountains in the sort of central bottom of the image, you can see a large lake. That's Lake Titicaca. That's the border with Bolivia. And then it runs up the coast all the way to the westernmost point of South America. That's Peru. And you see so you've got the coastal deserts, very narrow strip. Then you've got the Andes. Then we've got the Amazon basin going away. So that's just a sort of overview of where it is. And um, so, uh, yeah, my time in Peru, I'll just give a quick summary. So I first visited it as an illegal migrant. Um, I swam across the river because the border was closed in 1991. And uh, I've made a number of short visits to the Tumbizian region. I became more and more fascinated. And then I increasingly became involved for three years. I was for two years. I was um, the coordinator of an international initiative to protect the dry forests of the Tumbesian region between Ecuador and Peru following the peace agreement and the opening of the border. That was a great time and it got me involved with the Chaparri Reserve and I then saw an opportunity to really get involved and so I moved there and um, spent a couple of years working for nothing basically, helping the reserve get established, running the White Wing Grand reintroduction program, building the lodge there and then I needed a proper job. So I was very fortunate that Frankfurt Zoological Society contracted me. And for 10 years, I ran their Andes Amazon Conservation Program. Uh, when I left that, I did a bit of photography for National Geographic. And now I'm still involved with some of the conservation projects there. I go back as a sort of freelancer and I love guiding the tours there. Um, I'm very lucky that a lot of these jobs took me to remote areas of Peru and I managed to get a my Peru lists at 1,670 species at the moment. So I've seen quite a lot of the birds. There's still, I think, 11 endemics to go, and I hope to chip away at those over the coming years. So um, so as I was saying about Peru, basically you've got a narrow desert strip along the coast. Offshore, you've got the incredibly rich Pacific Ocean with the Humboldt current, the richest marine current in terms of um, the amount of carbon it fixes, basically how biologically rich it is. Um, in the world, then you've got the Andes Mountains in the brown, and then you've got in the sort of bluey green, the east slope, humid forests of the Andes, and then the Amazonian lowlands in the brighter green. Southern Peru has an amazing amount of birding. Uh, this is a map produced by the Peruvian government about the Southern Peru birding route. The red spots to the sort of the key areas, as you'll see, there's a big congregation of those around the city of, of Cusco. And the Southern Peru tour that Rock Jumper offers basically really focuses on those. If you see 21, 22, 23, 24, that's the famous Manu Road, um, possibly the best birding road in the world. And it's going to be featured heavily in the talk this afternoon. But why visit Southern Peru? Well, diversity. Here's a map of the number of bird species, the, the larger map in the Americas showing the brighter colors, the redder colors, the, the, the concentration. And you can see Southern Peru is a nice strip of red along the base of the Andes there at the edge of the Amazonian basin. And the, the three globes show from left to right birds, mammals, and uh, amphibian diversity. And you can see all of them again the lovely dark red is just in southern Peru uh, for all those taxa. And so it really is an absolutely incredibly, it's the most biodiverse place on earth, basically. Um, and so let's talk about birds in Peru. Well, there's about 1,850 species. Uh, there's a couple more being added. I think I need to, should have probably updated this today. But um, uh, 124 endemics, 126 near endemics, 117 globally threatened etc so and then i below are the the other lists some um, the other taxonomy treatments but um an awful lot of birds basically one of the top three countries in the world in terms of number of birds um and so what what a rock jumper offer in peru um in southern peru so there's a scheduled tours uh currently there's a lima with an ancash extension which is seven days, which goes before the main Southern Peru Andes tour, which is 14 days. And at the end of that, there's a little extension to go to Machu Picchu for those who would like to. Um, there's also tailor-made opportunities. You can all talk to Dan. And um, some of these could be the Van of Biosphere Reserve, including the lowlands. The, there's a whole bunch of new splits because of the amphitheater shake-ups and things. 
and there's some remote uh, birds that we don't have a fixed tour for yet, but uh, would be accessible in a tailor made tour in the southern, um, in southern Peru. And then there's other places like Lake Titicaca and the southwest Andes near the city of Arequipa. So those are some of the, the options. And I'm going to take you on those fixed tours. So I'm going to start with the Lima and Ancash uh, tours. This is a seven day tour. It starts on the coast and it includes the coastal habitats, desert lowlands and the lomas, which lomas are these hills that are high enough to get mist from the coming off the Pacific Ocean, which gives humidity. So you get a vegetation developing around that mist um, and that's known as Lomas. Uh, then you've got the arid Andes, and it goes all the way up to the beautiful Huascaran National Park, uh, home of the highest mountain, Mount Huascaran uh, in Peru. Um, and so it covers an altitude and a range from sea level to about 3,850 meters. Um, that's pretty high, but we, the detour is designed to take you up gradually. So the, the highest point is reached on the penultimate day of the tour, um, by which time I've guided this tour twice. No one's had any problems. Everyone's acclimatized. And yeah, I mean, it's hard work walking, but no one feels ill. So it is very carefully designed in that respect. So here's what you could expect. So offshore, we we see some uh, white vented storm petrels among many of the seabirds on the coastal rocks. Perhaps the most marine of all the passerine birds in the world, the surf synclodes, lives literally in the tidal splash zone. Um, feeding amongst the algae on little invertebrates, incredible bird, same zone inhabited by the fantastic blackish oyster catcher. And a very popular one always is the Inca tern, often for many people a highlight on this tour. We see many hundreds of these. Um, ooh, there's a storm petrel crept in again, sorry. Um, Peruvian tern, this is a, a very rare bird now. Um, it's declining fast. Uh, it's one of the least tern complex. And we make a special effort to try and find this on along the coast, but it's getting massive problems with disturbance and feral dog predation in the colonies and things. It really is in a lot of trouble. Um, there's a whole bunch of more widespread seabirds that are uh, restricted to the Humboldt current, including this belchers or bantail gull, uh, this Peruvian pelican. Um, we see the then just inside there's coastal wetlands. Uh, we've got many colored rush tyrant, a fantastic little tyrant flycatcher. The Spanish name of this is absolutely lovely. It's the seven colors of the reeds, which I, I love. Uh, the recently split Peruvian pipit was formerly considered part of the yellowish pipit complex. Now and a, a near endemic species also found in northern Chile. But And then as we move to the, the Lomas, these, these coastal hills that get some fog drip, we searched for least seed snipe, the smallest of all the seed snipe. Um, Peruvian thickney, usually found here as well. Um, uh, one of my absolute favorite birds. And the very nice uh, tawny throated dotterel of, there's an endemic subspecies in coastal Peru. And we make a special effort to find that. Uh, this is a, an interesting bird. It's almost always drawn wrong in all the bird books. Um, subspecies have black feet, but because the, the bare parts, I guess, fade on specimens, they're almost always drawn with pink legs and feet. But um, Oasis hummingbird. Um, this is the Peruvian coastal subspecies Kepkei. And the fabulous cactus canastero, an endemic bird to Peru, restricted to zones of columna cacti and we make a special effort to try and see this one then we get drive up into the andes and we check out an, a high altitude lake where we find the fabulous giant coot uh, i think any coot you've ever seen and sort of times it by three absolutely enormous beautiful birds um, so we're now getting up to higher elevations. So we spend a day then looking in the some arid valleys uh, just below the cordillera blanca mountains and we search for things like Rufus backed Inca finch. And in the same area, we find another very similar bird. Um, there's five species of Inca finch. They're all endemic to Peru. We also find the great Inca finch in the same area. Very similar looking birds, but um, slightly different habitat requirements. And it was fun to tease them out. So here we find the endemic black metal tail which is a very beautiful hummingbird, little bird on the 
the throat and this brilliant glittering tail. And this is in the sort of the, the, the lower forests of, of the Cordillera Blanca. And then we get up into Huascaran National Park and we go to the very beautiful Lake Yanganuco Lake. Uh, this is at 3,850 meters of elevation. And it's surrounded by these fabulous polylepis trees. Uh, polylepis is the highest altitude tree species in the world. It has this incredible flaky red bark as a sort of insulation of the cold area. Actually, at the top end of this valley is believed to be the highest altitude tree in the world. Um, we don't actually get up there on the tour because we bird in this forest around here. Um, I have been up towards the top end of the valley, and this is the kind of views you get looking back down. So you've got these amazing ice, permanently snow-covered and glacial mountains around, a real climber's paradise. And then down below, these lakes with the polylepis uh, woodland on the on the sides of that glacial valley. It's a good area for Andy and Condor. And you often see this very spectacular bird, one of my personal favourites. Um, the streams here often have white cap dipper in them and the woodlands give us a, a good range of birds um things like the fabulous um tit like dacnis this population here peter's eye is the subspecies is one of the brightest and biggest and absolutely fantastic bird another personal favorite of mine is stripe-headed ampitter as many of you will know some ampitters can be quite tricky to see. Uh, the stripe-headed is one that, at times it can be a little tricky, but often it, it once you find one calling, you can um, you can actually get quite close to them and they'll do silly things like sit on rocks in the open and call and, and give you fantastic views of an absolutely beautiful bird. Uh, it's very strange, almost frog-like call. Um, up here, we also find uh, Ancash Tapaculo, a very localized endemic. As many of you will know, again, many tam Citalopus tapaculos can be infuriating little beasts hiding in thick bamboo and thick understories and things, whereas the Ancash tapaculo, uh, at times it hides in thick stuff, but occasionally, again, it, it'll run out across a rock and just sit and have a look around. One of the really special birds we look for here is the white-cheeked Katinga. This was only described in the... 1960s i think um and it's in its own genus zaratornis um it's a tricky bird to find um because it makes very little noise indeed uh there are some calls but it doesn't make them very often and it's um so it sits quite quietly and uh, it tends to sit up when the sun hits the slopes um so you've got to get up early in the more right elevation and look for one uh, sitting up, sunbathing as it warms up for the day. So from there, from the Cordillera Blanca, the tour then goes back to Lima, does a little bit more on the coast, and then goes straight into the main tour. So it's like a, it's a sold as a separate tour, but it can be taken with the main tour as well. So the main Southern Peru tour is um, is a fourteen day trip. It focuses on the highlands of Cusco and the Aparimac regions. Uh, the montane forests of the eastern Andes, the subtropical forests in the Yungas elevation, um, and then the top end of the lowland tropical forests and rivers of the Amazonian sort of foothills. Uh, the elevational range is, um, the highest point is 4,400 metres, um, which we visit, it's a pass we visit one morning. Um, we've just walked down here, basically a tiny little uphill and then downhill all morning. Um, and then we drop down as low as about 500 meters into the edge of the Amazon in lowlands. So it's an in incredible diversity of habitats in this tour. Um, and so I'm going to deal with it in sort of two sections. I'll start with the Cusco Highlands. This should really be the Cusco and Aparimac Highlands. Um, so first of all, we, we head to the Aparimac Valley where we bird. A, this is a rain shadow valley. It's a very deep valley. It's a principal tributary of the Amazon and it forms this incredibly deep canyon and we bird in there in the drier forests that are around that rain shadow valley. We then do some birding on the arid high Andes, the sort of Puna grasslands and things around Cusco. Uh, we hit some polylepis forest, that lovely red bark tree with the flaky bark and some elfin forest and some upper montane cloud forest near Abra Malaga. 
Uh, we're right in the heart of the Inca Empire, so we go past several Inca sites. We'll have a brief stop and look at some of them. Um, uh, but this doesn't go to Machu Picchu. That That's on an extension. And the altitudinal range here is from 2,800 meters to that highest pass at 4,400. But again, it's designed so you start lower and it builds up. And the 4,400 meters is um, quite well into the tour. So everyone's fine by then. Yes, that little uphill is hard work, but... Uh, I've done it twice with groups and everyone everyone's been fine with it. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, a really interesting tour. So one of the first birds we look for is Aparimac, the Aparimac form of Kepke's screech owl. So Kepke's screech owl is an endemic bird to Peru. A few years ago, this was described. I was very fortunate to be uh, involved a little tiny bit with the helping with the description. Um, described as a new subspecies. It may well deserve to be split as a, a full species in the future. The problem is there's one population of Kepke screech owl that there are no genetic samples from. And so it was impossible when we were doing the description to work out how to treat it all because there's one population there's no samples from and it was not very accessible area at that time. So... Um, but it's a, a fabulous bird, and we'll we make a special effort to look for that early in the tour. And the same area hosts personally my all-time favourite owl, the fabulous buff-fronted owl. It's Legolius owl, it's like um, boreal owl, Tengmalm's owl. It's in that genus, and it's um, absolutely superb beast. And it's it's in the same area, so we'll make an effort for that. Then some of the highland birds we see in these grasslands, Andean ibis is a very nice one. Uh, the lovely puna snipe. Up here, we may get lucky and see some vicuñas. There's, there's a few places we go where there's vicuñas. And then around the forest edge, there's lovely birds like moustache flower piercer. The endemic white tufted sunbeam. And we find some more widespread but curiously rare birds like this white-tailed shrike tyrant. This is quite a widespread bird, but um, very patchy in its distribution. And there's a, a place we often often go birding. We we find that on this tour. The polylepis forests hold a bunch of unique species that are really restricted to that habitat, including the tawny tit spine tail. And on the last tour, we were very lucky to find a a an Andean snipe that allowed very good approach and good view for the whole group. It's it's a bird that um can be quite tricky to find. It's a sort of woodland wet woodland edge bird, and um, I think it was one of the highlights of our day in the polylepis habitat. Although we saw all the other specialities, I think watching this thing was really a, a highlight. So that's the that's the sort of highland area. And then we drop, then we head to the, the Manu area. Manu is a, a place that's very dear to my heart. Um, in my job with Frankfurt Zoological Society, it was one of the main protected areas I was involved with helping develop protection for and um, helping the Peruvian government in improving the protection of the park and dealing with the communities and things like that. It's... Um, it's an incredible, incredible diverse area. It's probably the most biodiverse protected area on earth. Maybe Medidi National Park in Bolivia, because it's got another 2,000 meters elevational range, um, could be, but it's not documented as such yet. Um, it's 17,000 square kilometers uh, national park, and that forms the core area of a biosphere reserve, which is also recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It has the most bird species of any, any protected area on earth. So just over a thousand species have been recorded in the park. Um, and it's got this fabulous road, the Manu Road, which allows access from the high elevations of the park at 3,600 metres. It's been extended now and it goes all the way down to 380 metres elevation. An incredible gradient going down through pretty good habitat the whole way. So it really gives you um, an incredible access to this east slope of the Andes, the full elevational gradient. And there's river access along the Alto Madre de Dios River and the Manu Rivers into 
the park. So here's a map of the park. Um, and you can see the, the road in red to the lower right hand side. Um, if you see there's a word Ahanako, A-J-N-A-A-C-O, that's the top park station. That's the corner of the park. Uh, that's 3,600 meters. And the road now actually runs all the way around to, um, to opposite the town of Bokamanu, right in the sort of upper right side. Um, you can see a little under Romero Rainforest Lodge, there's a town of Bokamanu, and the road continues all the way there. But basically, the key bit of the road is down to the town of Shintuya, as it's shown on this map. And that drops to about 580 meters elevation. And so it really is stunning. This is a this is the Kosnipata Valley, the river valley that the road runs down. Uh, this is taken from the road, and down below you can see another bit of the road. Uh, the heart, the um, Apu Kanyuai, Kanyuai at the top is the highest point in Manu National Park. That that rocky mountain at the top. Um, uh, but basically, you get this phenomenal elevational gradient and as you can see it's just going down through pure forest um there's a few little clearings and things in some farm areas in the in the sort of mid elevations or the lower mid elevations but really most of it goes down through incredible forest so it offers and it's not heavily transited so it offers an incredible birding experience of driving down and walking down this road um manu national park is also uh incredibly remote some areas of it um Right in the heart of the park, you've still got uh, indigenous families. This is a Machigenga family that had just moved to a, a Manga village, but they were really virtually sort of on contact was the term. Voluntary isolation is the term that's now tended to be used. Um, and so you, you've got this incredible cultural richness as well of the area, which is very interesting. And just to give you an idea, this is looking up from the Alta Madre de Dios River, near Amazonia Lodge, back towards the Cusco Andes. And those are peaks up at about 6,000 meters elevation that we're seeing in the distance. So you can see that in the range of that photo is the 6,000 meters down to 500 meters elevational range. And you can see those ridges and that's that's what the road's giving you access to, not quite up to the snow line, but um, so yeah, these incredibly beautiful, uh, rich cloud forests often, covered in mist, uh, very high levels of vegetation, and even in the dry season, often misty, etc., keeping it nice and moist. Um, lots of great birds here. One of the recent splits, I'm sure some of you are aware, the Rufus Ampitter complex just got sliced and diced um, into a number of species. In this area, we find the Urubamba Ampitter. Uh, there's a trail we often walk just around dawn, and you often find them bouncing along the trail ahead of you. Uh, the lovely golden-headed Quetzal, some of our sort of familiar Andean cloud forest birds. Area, white-collared jay. The, the fantastic grey-breasted mountain toucan, always popular and uh, lovely to hear and then get to see on the tour. Great hummingbirds here, including swordbill hummingbird. And big uh, montane tanager flocks, including grass green tanagers, mountain tanagers, lots of mass trogons. Sickle wing guans and Andean guans quite common along the road. At night, it's a good area for finding these cloud forest owls like Rufus banded owl. This is the elevation where I'm talking about the elevation at the moment from about 2,800 down to sort of 2,200. A little bit low, you start getting into the Andean Cock of the Rock um, area and there's a there's a little blind you can go to and watch these in the morning uh, display. Um, this is one of the, the this is the Saturata subspecies one of the best ones and um it doesn't actually have a white eye all the books say it's a white eye but it's actually a very very pale blue um it's a good area for torrent duck along the rivers here and we'll make a, a special effort to look for that that's a female also we start seeing some mammals in this area this is gray woolly monkey um there seem to be two sub two species of woolly monkey in the 
in the park and perhaps another one across the Madre de Dios River on the other side. So it's an incredible area for um, for primate diversity, about 13 species of primate in the park area. Uh, a very popular bird is Montane Solitary Eagle and uh, Manu Road's particularly good for, for finding them often even perch sort of eye level in the trees out from the road as it winds down through the forest. It's a good place for seeing military macaw as we head a bit lower. A bit seasonal, but um, often if you find a good fruiting tree, you can get quite big flocks of this absolutely fantastic, quite widespread, but low density and always a bit tricky to catch up with bird. Um, down at lower elevations, the fabulous lanceolated monklet is a a very popular one with the tours always. Same kind of area you get, start getting a few different hummingbirds, green fronted lance bill here, violet fronted brilliant. And we start getting lo more lowland species of tanagers and things, things like the fabulous paradise tanager. You get these big flocks, bay headed tanager. And uh, Real alone and speciality, opal crown tanager, all creeping into these foothills here. But we've got a foothill population of Amazonian umbrella bird as well. And you get, again, a different suite of owls and night birds to look for with things like lyre tailed night jar and stuff. And here's a refescent screech owl. So that's the sort of taking us down through the youngest habitat. And then we hit the Alto Madre de Dios River. And this is where the river becomes navigable, uh, the town of Shuntuya. So um, you've got the this range of hills just the other side of the river called the Pini Pini. And we take a boat a little bit down the river um, to a lodge. And we can see things like pie plover on the beaches and capped heron. You know, these are real Amazonian lowland birds now. Um, this area we can look at for hummingbirds, including the fabulous wire-crested thorntail golden-tailed sapphire and typical in lone birds a bit like collared puff leg uh, puff bird not puff leg sort of collared puff bird and great potu down here as well as we go down and the river opens up it becomes braided and you even get some river island type birds the river often has um fasciated tiger heron and because they're quite used to the boats, you can get incredible views of these as you go past on the boat. So long as, if the boat stops, they tend to fly off. But often, if the boat keeps moving, you get it just goes past slowly. They'll sit there and watch, but they're used to boats going past. Down here around the lodge we stay at is a, a very good place for Kepke's Hermit. This is an endemic to Peru. It's, it's also found on the northern Peru tour, but it's restricted to not very many sites on outlying ridges from on the east side of the main Andes. And so this is one of the sites and it's a speciality we look for there. It's the same area with the fabulous Gould's Jewel Front. And first, we get our first little wetlands here that have real Amazonian lowland birds like Hoatzin. This area also has a, a macaw claylick. Um, it's a, a reasonably small one, a few different species come in. Uh, macaw claylicks are very interesting that um, for a long time people didn't really know what they were for and it's now been worked out that the southeast Peru is the the global epicenter of macaw claylicks. Um, you get them up into Ecuador and things um, but basically it's where you're a long way from the ocean so the natural salt concentrations in fruits and things is very low and the macaws are coming for salt um, this thing of it, they're coming for the clay because it helps with toxins has been disproven and they're, they're coming for just salt. And so they're finding old strata that have been exposed by eroding rivers that have higher salt concentrations in and they really are taking the highest salt concentrations. So if you really want to see this, it's, it's Southeast Peru is the best place in the world to go to see uh, macaw clay licks. And you can go to some where there are in maybe, a, I don't know, eight eight or nine species of parrots coming in uh, to the same bank. 
a fairly widespread bird, but fairly typical of sort of Amazonian lowland um, wetlands is black cap Donacobius. We also find the, the lovely sun bittern down here. And um, one of my all time favorites uh, can be seen down here at the, the hummingbird gardens around the lodges, the lovely rufous crested coquette. It's a good area for long tailed potu, um, just on these, these outlying ridges. And we've got Amazonian lowland birds like um, the blue throated piping guan. So normally the main tour then turns back and heads back to Cusco because um, we've got down into the Amazon lowlands. I'll give you a little bit of a, a vision of, because I'm here already, of what happens if you keep going down river. This at the moment would have to be in a tailor made itinerary, but um, it's an area I absolutely love. I had the good fortune to work for 10 years. And so. It really is recommended. So this is the Manu River. This is the kind of boats that you travel in uh, to get down there. And you go can go down the Alto Madre de Dios River for a few more hours and then turn up into the Manu River and um, come to some Oxbow Lakes. This is the famous Cocha Salvador in Manu National Park. Um, there are more McClure clay licks down here along the roadside, on the riverside banks. And you also start getting more of the big, big mammals. This is the fabulous giant otter. I was fortunate to coordinate the research program on this for nearly a decade and absolutely probably the best mammal in the world, in my opinion. As you can see, they're not shy of taking on a, a formidable adversary. This is a one with a, a local sort of pike-like uh, predatory fish. Um, there's quite a lot of fish still under the water at the end here. Um, you also get... Uh, uh, like as the macaws and parrots come to clay licks so do the mammals they want salt as well and so the fruit eating and herbivorous animals like the brazilian tapir or lowland tapir come into clay licks it's probably the second best place in the world to see jaguar after the um after the pantanal and down here on a trip you i think you've got a good chance of seeing jaguar uh, it's not guaranteed perhaps as it almost certainly is in the Pantanal now, but it's, I would say, in the right months, it's well over 50% chance. Fabulous Emperor Tamarind, quite a range-restricted small uh, small primate, um, named after Emperor Wilhelm because of his moustache. And the lovely Black Cayman, Big crocodilian now. I, I think they get up to about seven meters now. They've been protected since 1972. And so they're sort of the second longest crocodilian in the world. Um, down here, you've got fabulous agami herons, agami agami. And this is a got to be the most beautiful heron in the world, I think. And uh, there is a breeding colony that is absolute delight to go and see them displaying when all those blue feathers on the side come straight out and get held out and absolutely incredible thing it's a good area also for finding harpy eagle because there are good primate populations and there's quite often a, a nest known um or you can just bump into them like i did with this one and there's some some of the sort of rarer widespread amazonian forest birds can be found down here like uh, zigzag heron and the horn screamer on most of these oxbow lakes and on the rivers and on the beaches so that's a little a little bit more of a sort of wet the appetite for the amazonian lowlands but that would have to be tailor-made so now we go back to the the machu picchu extension and this is a this is a trip um that takes four days it's basically designed to visit the Machu Picchu Citadel with a specialist archaeological guide and a birding guide. So you get to bird as well, but you also get a really good explanation of what has been found there. And um, having done years ago, I used to be a trekking guide on the Inca Trail. And I think the first seven times I got to Machu Picchu, each time we got a different archaeological guide, I heard seven different explanations for everything. And so we really try and find a, we have someone who worked as an archaeologist there now, and they're really good at saying, this is what we found, and this is what we think it might be. 
Uh, so it is a really informative way to see Machu Picchu and not just be given the the wacky aliens and the Incas brothel, et cetera, weird sort of hypotheses, but really tell you what's been found there. Um, it's great birding as well around Machu Picchu. Um, a lot of the species we were already seen, but there are it's a good spot for a few others. Um, you get to bird the subtropical habitats near Machu Picchu village, and you get a beautiful railway journey to and from Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu village is at 2,430 meters, and the highest point for this extension would be 3,400 meters, which is the altitude of Cusco, because it goes to and from Cusco. Um, so this is what Machu Picchu looks like. That the little mountain in the back is Picchu, and the main, the sun gate is on the to the left side. That that little protuberance uh, with the building on the top. That's the the most sort of sacred and important site. This is taken from the quarry area because it was still under construction. Um, some of the good birds you can find here, the endemic yellow scarf tanager is quite quite easily found in the forests around Machu Picchu. Uh, it's probably the best spot for green and white hummingbird, which I didn't actually put a, I mean, a photo in for. It's a very good place for torrent duck. Uh, right in the village, you can sit and watch from the restaurants, uh, torrent duck pairs on the rocks in the in the stream. So I'll just give you a few tailor-made ideas um, for southern Peru. Lake Titicaca, we don't currently go to on a fixed itinerary, but it could be easily be added on. Um, it's five hours uh, easy travel from Cusco by vehicle, and you've got the endemic Titicaca grebe. You've also got other great wetland species and high altitude species. There's the Puno Highlands. This split up of the Rufus Ampitra has split one as Puno Ampitra. It's a new species. I'm um, just described in that paper that uh, was splitting them up. And to get that and a bunch of other sort of rare things that creep it right on the Peruvian Bolivian border, you can do a trip into the Puno Highlands. The Arequipa Highlands, this is the southwest Andes. You've got these soda lakes with good numbers of flamingos of the three Andean species, Chilean, Andean, and James's flamingos. You've got the fabulous Colca Canyon with its condors, and you've got other good puna birding um, up there. There are, again, this Rufus Ampita and Chestnut Ampita split up has created a bunch of, and a few other taxonomic revisions, have created a bunch of um, new species that are currently not offered on any fixed itinerary. Uh, but could be fitted into a tailor-made program. I would do something in the Aparimac, Ayacucho and Cusco Highlands. You can do a sort of circuit in there and pick up things like Vilcabamba thistletail, Ayacucho thistletail, Ayacucho ampita, uh, etc. Um, there's a whole suite of things in there and a, a whole bunch of subspecies that are probably, I suspect, will be split when people work on those groups in the future. And then the Manu lowlands that I talked about, mega diversity, birds, mammals, herpetofauna, butterflies, dragonflies, etc. So this is Titicaca, just to give to wet the appetite a little bit. And there's the endemic grebe, really fantastic bird. And so now I'll finish up by telling you what is available uh, currently uh, for 2024 in Peru. Northern Peru main tour is full. That's with Dushan. Uh, the Northern Peru, there isn't a Scarlet Banded Barber extension. There's a couple of spaces available on that. Um, I'm now doing the Central Peru Rare Andean Endemics tour uh, in, from end October into November. And there's a few spaces left on that. And there's one space left on a tour, which I'm doing to Iquitos, which is the 10th to 19th of October. Just one space left on that one. Otherwise, there's a pretty full itinerary, uh, a full suite of tours for next year, Northern Peru, Central Peru, Southern Peru, uh, spaces available on all those for 2025. But if you want to come along on 2024, there's not many spaces left. So please do think about booking in. So I just like to thank you all for listening. I hope that was a, a whistle stop. Uh, wet the appetite for southern Peru. It really is an absolute fabulous place that I was privileged to be able to call home for 10 years. And I always love going back there and I hope to see some of you in Peru soon. Wonderful. Thank you so very much, Rob. Your expertise and experience in Peru certainly speaks for itself. I think I'm just about ready to book a flight myself and get across 
to southern Peru as soon as possible. <laughs> Looks absolutely brilliant. From the cock of the rocks to the coquettes, harpy eagles, a gami heron, and then the cultural highlights of Machu Picchu. It certainly looks like a destination that has, has it all. Um, Rob did mention that we have a few final spaces remaining on our upcoming tours of southern Peru. If you would like to inquire about any of these uh, final remaining spaces, please feel free to get in touch with us via email at info at rockjumper.com. Alternatively, you can inquire through our website and our lovely team from the support department will be in touch with you in due course with more information about these tours. But Rob, in the meantime, we do have two questions that um, guests have sent in um, while you were speaking. The first is from Catherine. She asks, what is the best time of year for the four tours? Could you please speak a little bit in terms of seasonality in southern Peru? Okay, so southern Peru, basically, the the main thing to worry about is the wet season in the Amazon. And that starts end of November and goes through till April, but what, a, yeah, April-ish. So this, the tours are, um, are designed to go just after that. Um, so water levels should be back down, but it's so dry yet, etc. And it's, um, if you get into July and August, we did the first tour we offered in Southern Peru that I was guiding um, a, a number of years ago. We were a little bit later and we just were incredibly unlucky. We got hit with a cold front that came up from the um, from sort of Antarctica. They roll up the whole way over Southern South America. And these are called friajes and two, three, four come up every year, usually between July and September. And we just got, we were a little bit later and we got hit by one the day we went down into the lowlands and it was just silent because it is so cold and drizzling and the birds just go quiet. So now it's been brought forward a little bit to fit in that window where it doesn't mean you couldn't get one, but it just reduces the probability. So that's when I would go. The other option is to go a bit later. Um sort of September, October into beginning of November. But July, August, it can be absolutely brilliant. If you don't get a cold front, it's fantastic. But if you get a cold front, A, it can be really cold and there's nowhere colder than the Amazon basin when it's six degrees and 100% humidity and drizzling and you're on boats and things, that's really cold. And you don't think of the Amazon like that. It's the only place I've ever got hypothermia. Um, so... Um, that's that's the timing basically for these tours to try and fit in that window, avoid the avoid the wet season and take out the risk of the Amazon getting scuppered by a cold. Perfect, thanks, Rob. Alan did then add that several tourists were stranded at Machu Picchu last year, and that's what he was referring to. I wonder if that has something to do with the uh, political reform, as you briefly touched on. Um, yeah. He yeah, tourists have been standing at Machu Picchu a couple of times for various reasons. There was um, there were some landslides that took out the railway and some people got stuck there. Uh, it's not a bad place to get stretched because the village, you know, there's, there's nice hotels, there's plenty of food, etc. It's not like you're stuck in the middle of nowhere, not able to get out. You know, you've got a hotel bed and a restaurant and things. Um, and then there was, when there were these big strikes... Um, they blocked the railway and things, and some people were stranded for a couple of days. But the government got them out pretty quickly. Um, and that was an exceptional situation that I don't think we'll see repeat again for, I hope, for a very long time. Perfect. We do have a few more questions coming in for you. The next one is from Judith Allenson. Hi, Judith, a familiar name through TaylorMade Tours. Is there a good chance of seeing the Humboldt Penguin on the Ankash extension? Yes, yes. Um, the last day of the Ancash extension goes to a place. I could have put a picture in, but I could have put a thousand species in. I, I didn't put a, a Humboldt penguin. But where you see the blackish oyster catch and the surfs and clodies, you usually see Humboldt penguin as well. Perfect. And then Catherine Carroll next asks, what is the meaning of R.D.? Sorry, I do did miss the reference to that, Catherine, but perhaps Rob knows what the meaning of RD is. Um, 
may have been mentioned in one of your earlier slides. Uh, I can't think what RD was, I'm afraid. Um, so I'm sorry, uh, I need a bit more information. I, I must have missed it myself. Sorry about that, Catherine. Maybe you can post a uh, another question, just giving us a bit more context to that. Um, I'm sure it would have been mentioned somewhere, but um, we are missing that reference. Next, Neil Lamb asks, what is the recommended Peru uh, field guide? Do you um, have a particular favorite, Rob? The, the only one to really use at the moment is the Schulenburg et al., um, I'm just seeing if I can grab a copy. I don't know. Uh, it's mine somewhere around. I was looking at it uh, yesterday. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's uh, published by Hellman in the UK and Princeton in the United States. Um, it's a little bit out of date now. It's also an app you can get on your phone. Um, it, yeah, it's a little out of date. Um, uh, but it's it's the own. It's the best one still, and it's. It's a good, good guide. Perfect. Then Nancy's got a question. Hi, Nancy. I remember you na your name very well from the Antarctic cruise. Nancy asks, is a yellow fever shot mandatory for Peru? And I can answer that. The yellow fever vaccine isn't a requirement for entry into um, Peru. Having said that, if you are arriving from any destination or have recently visited a destination where yellow fever is prevalent, then the vaccine will be required. Um, but as of, I believe it was 2002, the WHO uh, changed their regulations about the yellow fever vaccine. And the yellow vaccine has now been shown to be effective for life. So if you have had the vaccine at any point in your life, then your vaccination will still be considered valid so long as you have the yellow fever card to show. Gary Can then asks... Um... Yep. There are a couple of spots in the lowlands, sometimes in Manu National Park, if you're going, depending how far you're going up, this would only affect a tailor-made trip. Um, if you're going to get to the indigenous area, then they do ask for it there um, to protect the indigenous populations. But uh, that's e exceptional. Perfect. Thanks for that, Rob. And then Gary asks, is Royal Synclody seen on the higher elevation portion of the tour? Yes, it is. Um, I'm afraid I just don't have a very good photo of one. <laughs> <laughs> and so I didn't put it in. Um, uh, we saw it very well on the, the last trip. We saw it, but it was a bit distant and it was slightly, unfortunately, it came out slightly uphill of us. Um, but on the previous tour, we saw it very well, but I hadn't taken my camera that. So. Perfect. And then getting towards the end here, Gillian asks, assuming the temperatures are pleasant at the beginning of the main tour, does it begin to get hot and humid as the lower you go into the Amazon basin? Uh, absolutely, yes. Um, the temperatures are very nice. Uh, the coastal area can become quite cool um, because you've got this offshore Humboldt current which is coming in Antarctica so it's quite it's a cold ocean so it keeps the coast quite moderately cool often you're wearing a light fleece or something uh then you go up into the Andes where you obviously get a bit cooler um but very can be very nice and warm in the sun and then as you drop into the Amazonian lowland yes it does get hotter Perfect. Thank you. There are a few responses here about the mysterious meaning of RD. Um, there's a few guests who say that they um, it might be the tour leader signed to the uh, Scholar Banded Barbet extension. I have just double checked the website and that is Dushan, one of our senior tour leaders in South America. So I don't think that was re uh, cause for the reference. It may have been a typo in Rob's slides. Um, but we will see if we can figure that out. Um, Rob, I then have one question. I know it's a primary concern for um, a few guests in certain areas where we visit high altitudes. Could you just touch very briefly for those guests who may have signed on a little bit late this evening, just in terms of the altitudes, maximum altitude we reach on these tours, the risk of altitude sickness. Um, I know that 
uh, would be a concern for some guests. And I think you, you uh, may be in a position to provide some reassurances there. Yeah, I mean, these tours do go to high altitudes. If you want to see these Andean birds, you have to go quite high. Um, but we've designed the itineraries very carefully to take you up as slowly as we possibly can so that you don't just go straight into high altitude. You build up, you sleep lower and go up and go up. So it's designed to acclimatize, as is the northern Peru tour, the central Peru tours, etc. They're all designed to give you a chance to acclimatize. Um, yes, the air can get thin. People get a little bit puffy walking at times, but I've never had anyone get really altitude sickness. I've had people who said, I am I have altitude sickness, I'm not feeling very well. And almost always they're dehydrated because when you breathe out at higher altitude, you lose a lot more liquid with every breath you breathe out and people dehydrate. So the one really important thing is keep very well hydrated. Um, but yeah, the toys are designed. The highest point on the uh, Southern Peru tour um, is Abra Malaga, the Royal Synclodes, etc. Polylepis forest, and it's 4,400 meters, where you get out of the vehicle and you have to walk uphill slightly, and then it, and then it just walk all. We take a, a loop road, and the vehicle meets us below um, a loop trail all morning walking down. Um, so there is a slight uphill to do first to get over the ridge to walk down. Um, but everyone manages it fine. You just take your time, take it easy and uh, keep hydrated because we've given that time to to acclimatize. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rob. And then one final question, Elise Fake, another familiar name from TaylorMade. Hi, Elise. Elise asks, how many different species can one expect to see on the different portions of the Southern Peru tour? I don't know if you have those figures offhand. If not, I can send you an email with those figures tomorrow, Elise. Yeah, I think the the Ancash extension is not a very high number. It's a hundred and I don't know, 40, 50. Um, but it's very high on endemics and things like that and specialities. Um, but it's in the lower diversity. Um, and then the the main Cusco tour. Uh, Cusco Highlands and down into the East Slope is going to be about 450-ish, I would think. And the Machu Picchu extension, um, it will add you a few more, um, probably. Um, but probably, see, I don't know, depends how much you bird there, but I, I would think you'd see 130, 140 species, but you get only a few that weren't seen on the main tours, really. Um, yeah, there will be, I don't know, five, ten um, that probably weren't seen on the main tour. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Rob. The chat section is full of clients uh, writing in, just thanking you for an incredibly insightful um, talk on Southern Peru. And um, from us as well, thank you very, very much for sharing your experience in this incredible area. Um, we had 122 guests sign on this evening from many different parts of the world. So thank you all for taking the time out of your days. Um, I know uh, it's evening time here in South Africa, where I'm based. Um, it's also evening in the UK, but I know it's uh, maybe not the most convenient time in some other parts of the world. So thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us this evening um, and to hear what Rob had to say about Southern Peru. And I think on that note, we will end the talk there. Please remember on the 27th of March, Stefan Lawrence is going to be introducing um, suddenly gone blank as to what he's Northwest Western Argentina is what Stefan's going to be introducing. So that's the 27th of October. Thereafter, we have talks on the Indian Ocean Islands and a few other exciting destinations that we had not covered previously in our Dream Destination series. So once again, a final thank you to you all, a special thank you to you, Rob, and have a wonderful day, evening, wherever in the world you are, and we hope to see you on tour with us sometime soon. Have a good evening, everyone.